when I came up in the 1980s, right out of Bible college, the big issue was that the church was in no way relevant to society. So all the teachings in the seminars were about how to take the church and make it relevant, how to how to make your stage more appealing, how to make your building more welcoming, how to dress in a way that didn't send a message of, um, you know, that there was some kind of a barrier between you and the people you were trying to minister to. Your generation, which expects that in many ways, but also wants authenticity at the same time. Maybe the pendulum has swung so far that you can actually succeed in ministry by having all of the superficial brand pieces of it and not having the raw core of what it is to be a follower of Christ. Yeah. Is it empty? Is it shallow? Is it superficial doctrinally, in, in strategy, in practice, in lifestyle? And how can you tell the real thing, the authentic thing, from something that just looks good on Instagram? Hey, welcome to the Allison Park Leadership Podcast, where we uncover the principles behind the plans. Uh, I'm, I'm one of your hosts. My name is Dave. And my name is Jeff, and we're glad you've joined us. Uh, so I'm the lead pastor at Allison Park Church, and this is actually my son, Dave, who's also a campus pastor at the Northside Campus. And uh, we are stepping up our game today. Look at this. We've got a couple of camera angles going on. I mean, way to go. So as we're in season two, uh, we're trying to get a little bit better at how we do this. So we hope that you enjoy the episode Yeah, today. thanks for your patience because we found out last week that among a bunch of things went wrong, my mic was turned backwards, which is my fault, and we didn't have the right camera lens. But we're back. We're, back. we're ready to go today. Come on. So uh, I'm excited. I, I hope this looks and sounds a lot better than it has in the past for those of you who are uh, Actually, this is a great time to actually talk about this particular topic, because the question is, should pastors go back to being uncool again, should, should, and here yeah. we are talking about how we just upgraded our images <laughs> <of> podcast. <laughs> well, the thing is, I think there's a level of uncool that we were really at, which is just terrible, <laughs> in terms of some of the quality. So, so our technological proficiency wasn't at, at, at a minimum standard, is what we are We're jumping ahead of ourselves. <laughs> here's, here's part of why. Typically, I just hit Jeff with a bunch of questions fresh that he doesn't even know, but we did a whole podcast and then realized how bad it was, and I delayed yeah. a couple of weeks. Week, so you already know what's coming. Okay, but so the, the title is, Should Pastors Be Uncool Again? And this whole podcast um, was sort of sparked by something that happened a few weeks, maybe even months ago at this point. And it, it was, you know, after the after the moral failure and fall of, of Pastor Carl Lentz of Hillsong, New York, um, you know, there was a, an article written by the, the lead singer, frontman of the band Skillet, Christian band Skillet. His name is John Cooper. And he, he, write, he wrote... <laughs> wrote an article uh, called Make Pastors Uncool Again that really kind of sparked a nationwide conversation about this. And so I want to talk today to you, Jeff, about should pastors be uncool again? How have they become too focused on superficiality and being cool? But let me first start by reading some of this article. I actually have two different ones I'm going to read. I want to first start by uh, reading this one by John Cooper. He actually put it, posted it on Facebook. That's That was the medium. And so I'm not going to read the entirety of this, but I'm sure you could find this if you want to Google it. Uh, make pastors uncool again. He says, pastors shouldn't be rock stars. Yeah, I said it. A rock star promotes himself, builds his brand, and entertains people. It's his job. A pastor is supposed to lay his life down for a sheep. He serves, he protects, he equips the saints for the works of ministry. Uh, he says, Man, many Christians have been saying this for years, and it's past time that I join them. I'm tired of celebrity pastors. Pastors aren't supposed to be cool. They're not supposed to be fashion trendsetters. We are all called to decrease that Christ would increase both in our hearts and in our lives. His fame should be known, not ours. Celebrity pastors, get out of the way. You're hogging the spotlight. Okay, I'm going to skim through some of this. At the end, he says, playtime is over. The spiritual battle is raging, and the field is full of wimps and boys who have never picked up a sword because it just feels mean. We need generals and leaders who don't care about their brand, their look, their likes, or making allegiances with the world. In short, it is time to make pastors uncool again. Okay, so that was a little snippet, a lot of it actually, of, of what John Cooper wrote. And there was another one that was written very shortly after this uh, by a journalist named Ben Six, Six Smith um, from The Spectator, and he, he wrote you know, and he article. is not a believer. This, He's not a believer, yeah. right. 
he, so he's writing from, an, from a non-Christian perspective. He wrote this article called The Sad Irony of Celebrity Pastors. And this is just a little snippet from the end. This sort of a summary. So if you want to read this, Google The Sad Irony of Celebrity Pastors. But he says at the end, so, uh, so if Christianity is such an inessential add-on, he's talking about based on what we've seen from celebrity pastors, if it's such an inessential add-on, why become a Christian? I am not religious, so it is not my place to dictate to Christians what they should and should not believe. Still, if someone has faith, uh, if someone has a faith worth following, I feel their beliefs should make me feel uncomfortable for not doing so. If they share 90% of my lifestyle and values, then there is nothing especially inspiring about them. Instead of making me want to become more like them, it looks very much as if they want to become more like me. That sadly appears to have been true of Lent and his celebrity acquaintances. Okay, so let's start with this um, because I think this is kind of important. This is not just a roast session of Pastor Carl Lentz. Right. You know, I think No, that, so you're giving an example from him and the reactions to him. Yes. But ultimately, this is a much bigger question than that. So we're Absolutely. not trying to pick on, especially somebody who's had a fall. I mean, no. we don't want to be the kind of people that are going after people during those times. But it just brings up a topic, I guess, that is one that even people who aren't Christians are curious about. Yeah, and it, and it was such a prominent, you know, a prominent event because... Carl Lentz was the pastor of Hillsong in New York, probably the biggest church congregation at least known globally, you know, starting in Australia and then, you know, all over the globe. And he was one of their most prominent public figures and one of the, the biggest known pastors in America, really. Okay, so... Not- and, and when I, someone like myself, who um, I'm, maybe I'm not, I don't want to think of myself as uncool, but but I, I, look, I look at a person like Carl Lentz and he's got the leather jackets and the tattoos and the cool hairstyles. And and you look at Instagram pro posts and you think, wow, this guy is with the in crowd. Yeah. You know, so like um, being the pastor of Hillsong, he's, he's so relevant. He's so cool. He's connected with people who are celebrities in Hollywood, Hollywood. And it sort of can make somebody who's not in the cool crowd feel a little bit like, wow, I'll never live up to that standard, as if that is a standard of some sorts. So I think in some ways, some people may have felt that way. I never personally was even trying to be cool. But if 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 I felt like I was left out, and then I watched Carl Lentz fall, in some ways, it sort of validates something I felt all along. Like, see, it wasn't really real, right? And But then there is this other question, which is, was it bad? Was it wrong? Is it, is it an improper emphasis? And I think that's one of the questions we're trying to address. Yeah, so so you see, you know, a fallout of someone who people have labeled the apostle of cool, you know, it's sort of derogatorily, but, um, and, and <laughs> some of this might seem to be related. Well, it's because he was pursuing these superficial things. Whether it was or not, it has sparked this whole conversation. But this is one that's been really kind of raging in, in the Christian world for a little while. I mean, our, our, you know, Josh and Caleb, are my, two of my brothers, basically every time we, we, we have dinner, you know, <laughs> debate about whether, you know, owning $500 shoes is inappropriate for a pastor. Or yeah. And should. the reason why you asked that question is because there's this Instagram site, Preacher Sneakers, right? Preachers, preachers and Sneakers. Preachers and An Instagram sneakers. profile, an Instagram site. So, see, Come that on. shows my uncool <laughs> nature. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and then, and it kind of started humorously where the guy was pointing out uh, how expensive, because I guess there's a whole culture of really nice tennis shoes. Sneakerheads, yeah. Okay, so, uh, and and so he started to show a picture, how much the shoes were worth, and then it became like like viral, right? Everybody's looking at this, now he does shirts and outfits too, um, and so there's a big debate over, well, that's great, look how relevant they are, or that's really superficial, it, it, it makes me sick, right? So there, that's the tension point between those two things. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so all of this has sort of this air of superficiality and a focus on being cool or trendy or a cultural influencer has been a poison and a uh, a toxic element of Christianity that maybe has blown Western Christianity off course. Okay. So there's a lot more to get into. Than that, and I think that even someone like John Cooper probably has more. He would say, "Oh, it's more than just that." But that's that's a key element of this article. Yeah. You know, make pastors uncool again. So let me start with this. Do you think that Western Christianity has been blown off course when it comes to its moral backbone? Oh my, that's a huge question. How do you even address that one? Western Christianity blown off its course from its moral backbone. 
So <clears throat> I think there's a tremendous amount of fogginess over what Western Christianity is right now on so many different levels. Um, the moral backbone, that also has so many things that we could dive into. I think it may be better to say, ask the question like this, how close are we to the New Testament values that Jesus taught us to live? Because I don't think we can answer that first question without going down nine different paths. So if we look at, okay, Jesus gave us the pattern to follow, and he established what five, the fivefold ministry gifts are to equip the church to live this revolution of introducing people to the risen Jesus. And to do that in such a way to, that is not a distraction from or uh, undermining the cause of what it is to be a, a true follower of Jesus Christ. So historically, I mean, you've seen the pendulum that has gone back and forth. Um, I just finished reading a, a biography of Martin Luther. And in his day, if you wanted to be a religious person, the severely religious were monks. So they were... They were living in cloisters. They were away from society. They were taking vows of poverty. Um, but they also became so distant from everything that they became somewhat irrelevant to the everyday person. Um, and so the question would have been asked back then, is, is being spiritual, being um, wearing burlap and taking a vow of poverty, and is it wrong to live a, a full life and be married and have kids and you know, all of the things that go along with, with uh, being in life. On the opposite extreme of that, you might have this whole situation with Carl Lentz as an Instagram influencer. So between the monk on one side and the Instagram influencer on the other side, what should a Christ follower, let alone a pastor, where do we fit in that spectrum of things? That's the question. Is there a wrong on that spectrum? And what do we evaluate? I actually think in some ways I'm supposed to be asking you these questions because your generation is struggling with this probably even more than mine. And so let me ask you, why is this such a big deal? Why is... This particular question. So I think, I think that when we look at someone who had a moral failure like, like Carl Lentz, um, there's there's a little bit of a linking to see you know th there's validation that some of this is toxic but i think that it probably is a lot bigger than that excuse me um i think that for for a lot of the people that i've talked to in my generation and the generation beneath us th there is this layer of you know a lot of what's being preached in churches is done for you know getting the maximum audience to not okay. offend anybody it has a layer of superficiality no depth it, it could be a ted talk um and that feels sort of in you know inadvertently or maybe inherently tied to the kind of coolness like oh we want this awesome stage with a great you know lighting and set and and sound you know soundscape and all of this like it, it needs to look like a rock concert and we want our pastor to be wearing you know the the coolest throwback Jordans or a Gucci belt buckle or you know Supreme and whatever Drew House like all all the stuff that a lot of these guys have and it it it's gives a certain amount of like normalcy you know clout of of I don't know. So I, I think for my generation, it's like, have, have we really lost what it is to be a Christian because we're pursuing, you know... Things that are being... image-oriented. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I guess, we, you know, you know last time... What's really interesting is that in my perspective, so I'm in my mid-50s, is that your generation has demanded that the church become relevant in those arenas. So what's what's so almost funny in a way for me, it's not really funny, it just shows the transition, is that when I came up in the 1980s, right out of Bible college, the big issue was that the church was in no way relevant to society. So all the teachings and the seminars were about how to take the church and make it relevant, how to, how to make your stage more appealing, how to make your building more welcoming, how to dress in a way that didn't send a message of... Um, you know, that there was some kind of a barrier between you and the people you were trying to minister to. So we went through this whole baptism of relevance yeah. where we learned about image and we learned about brand and we learned about how to have social media presence. And now what you're saying is your generation, which expects that in many ways, but also wants authenticity at the same time. Maybe the pendulum has swung so far that you can actually succeed in ministry by having all of the superficial brand pieces of it and not having the raw core of what it is to be a follower of Christ. Yeah. Is it empty? Is it shallow? Is it superficial doctrinally, in, in strategy, in practice, in lifestyle? And how can you tell the real thing, the authentic thing, 
from something that just looks good on Instagram? And that is a really good question to ask. So let's talk about that pendulum swing. I remember whenever I was growing up, you know, I just turned 30. So when I was growing up in the early 90s, I remember this very almost religious, pharisaical part of a culture that could easily get into the church. You're wearing a Mickey Mouse shirt. You know what I mean? They, <laughs> they support the LGBTQ. Like, <laughs> yeah. They had a parade in Disney. How dare you? You know what I mean? Like you, you, you had to look a certain way and make sure you didn't represent things. And it felt like the church was very separate from culture and was kind of judgmental on the culture. And so there was a rebalancing of trying to bring Christianity back into normalization, de-weirdifying and, you know, unreligifying. I'm not sure you say that, <laughs> what, what the church was. But like now I think where we swung, it, it, you know, the, the message, if, if I had to say there's a message that feels like attached to this hype culture, you know, this culture of cool, it tends to always be focused on, hey, your blessing is on its way. Breakthrough is here. You know, everything you ever wanted is coming. Live your best life. And it's, it's stuff that feels very temporal and a little bit like a felt, like, it's, it, you know, we, we, we used to talk about felt needs with, with the whole church planning sure. movement, right? Preach to the felt need, meaning to what people are actually going through and not just to intellectual or theological depths. Preach to felt need. Now it feels like that has swung so far that all you ever hear is, you know, the love of God the bl- and the blessing, probably. Blessing, blessing, blessing. And when you read the Bible, especially the teachings of Jesus, it doesn't seem to be the crux of the message. Yeah. So I think every, so every era in Christian history t- takes on a little bit of the good and a little bit of the bad of the prevailing culture of the day. So if you were to go into any century in any nation um, or any particular people group or demographic, even within a particular nation, you would find the good and the bad that the culture uh, has as a part of it. So culture is culture. We can't we can't live to serve culture, but we got to realize that culture is a language that we all speak, and we can't reach our 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 generation without speaking the language of our culture. The culture can't shape us; we have to shape it. Um, so we have to speak the language of it, but then we have to answer to and be driven by the person of Jesus Christ. So culture is not. Uh, sanctified. Methodology is not sanctified. It's really all about what does it take to reach somebody. So maybe we've just forgotten what it is to really follow Jesus. Maybe we need to reinterpret for this era, for our culture, for this generation, what does it actually mean to follow Jesus? And can you follow Jesus and have a brand? I think the answer is yes. Okay, so right? that that's a this is a really good question. What you just set up for me. Here's my follow-up, okay? Is there a causal link between being cool and either moral failures or moral moral timidity, you know, w- not having a hard stand. Because what you're just talking about is maybe we've swung too far, yeah. and maybe we've lost all that. Is that related to, is, that, is, is there a causal link? I don't think there is. I think it's being way too harsh on <clears throat> celebrity pastors to say that all celebrity pastors are more tempted to have a moral failure than others. In fact, there's a, just recently another really well-known Christian leader internationally, Rabbi Zacharias, yeah. who's a Christian teacher, <clears throat> not a cool in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. I mean, suit and tie, very relevant in the, the things he would talk about, and not superficial either in, in his theology. I mean, he was one of the greatest uh, apologists, you know, an argue, arguer for the Christian faith alive, yeah. and he had a moral failure. Yeah. In fact, pretty horrible things. Yeah, way, way yeah, worse. Way worse than Carl Lentz. Yeah. And so we can't tie moral failure to Carl Lentz and not tie it to Rabbi Zacharias because both of them had a failure. And that just that just speaks of the frailer, failure of the frailty of humanity in yeah. general. Yeah. Um, but I do think the question that the, the the guy that was writing, he's from a secular perspective, he's not a believer, and he was writing. Oh, yeah, Ben Sixsmith. Okay. Sure. He, he's asking a question that is, what do you have to offer beyond relevance I love your tattoos, your, 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 your sneakers. You, man, what a great Instagram post. I love how, how effective a communicator you are. You're an amazing motivational speaker. I'm attracted by the idea that you're declaring blessing over my life. But is there anything else? Because I can get that from other parts of the American culture. Um, it's not necessarily Christianity. So why follow Jesus? What is it about your life that should make me lean in and say, You've got something I don't have. Well, let's let's even zoom in on, on what he said at the end. He said, if ninety if we share ninety percent of our values, 
then it seems like you would be more like me than the opposite. I mean, 90% of values is basically the same, right? There, there's, I mean, that's in, like even, even people that are both atheists probably only share 90% of their values a lot of the time because people are all different. So he's essentially talking about how there has been this air of in, indistinguishability between certain Christians in that culture and between non-Christians or yeah. casual seekers or whatever you want to say. So I don't know the percentage. That's a really hard thing because I don't know him to know what his values are. But I do think there is this. What makes a person distinguish distinguishable as a follower of Jesus Christ is one central idea. And it's really simple to boil it down to, and that's this. We believe Jesus rose from the dead. That's, that's what Christianity is founded upon. Jesus is alive. He is the Son of God, and he proved it by raising from the dead. Because he's alive, I've encountered him, and he's transformed me, which has taken me from being self-consumed to being consumed about serving the world. Uh, it takes me from being somebody who's selfish to someone who's generous. It takes me from being somebody who's trying to please themselves all the time to someone that's willing to deny themselves for a greater, greater cause. But that if, if we do have 90% in common, and the 10% is that belief in the resurrected Jesus, then that should be attractive because that's what makes everything work. It's this idea that we believe in Jesus Christ risen from the dead. Um, for me, it's not about morality. It's, it's it, okay, does he make us live a more moral life? Christ, absolutely, he transforms us. It's really about a person. It's about pointing to the person of Jesus Christ can I do that and be cool? Yes. Can I do it and be uncool? Yes. As long as I'm authentically me and I am pointing to the risen Jesus and the fact that he's changed me and transformed me. And now I'm calling people to live a more aggressively Jesus-like lifestyle. Then I don't think branding and image, smoke machines and sneakers uh, take away from that unless we can say, boy, that really hinders me hearing the gospel because I can't, I can't hear anything you're saying because of the way you're presenting yourself. That can be said true on both sides. Like you can be so irrelevant that people will be like, dude, come on, like you got to get into this century. And then you can be so relevant that the messaging really gets lost in there. But I think the core of a Christianity is it's about the person of Jesus Christ. Yeah. So what, what, what complicates this issue is that when you're thinking about the difference between celebrity pastors, and I'm, I'm not saying there isn't, but perception-wise, at least for someone like, like you wrote this article, you think about the difference between celebrity pastors and, say, Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio when he's making his speech at the Oscars, and they're both talking about justice, and they're both talking about humanitarian causes and you know being about more than themselves but making a difference in the world it's like, okay, like you have slightly different values, you have different perspectives, but sometimes that might look like there's not a big difference. Whereas if you think of Leonardo DiCaprio versus Mother Teresa, or if we use somebody from another religion, you know, um, Gandhi, right? Or someone who's sort of living in an impoverished state and sacrificing and, you know, taking a beating for it or whatever, there seems to be this attractiveness. Like, wow, they're willing to sacrifice their lifestyle for their faith. So I think that, yeah, 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 but think about this, though, though. When we all hear about Mother Teresa, I'm, I'm a dad. I have five kids and four grandkids. I have a mortgage to pay. Um, so if I'm going to live like Mother Teresa, now I have to move to India. I have to lay everything down, and I've got to serve every day as a single person like Mother Teresa did to help the people of Calcutta. If that's the only way you can actually be a radical Christ follower, then what that makes people do is cross that off their list. I will never be that radical. So therefore, I'm going to have these two separate categories, the Mother Teresas of the world, which are the real spiritual ones, and then the rest of us, which are all living slightly compromised lives. I don't actually think that's true. I think you can be a normal human being with a family and a job and be a radical Christ follower right in the environments that you're in. And I don't think it's unholy to be normal, um, but you can also be radical in your convictions about following Christ. So we can we can lift the standard of of you know the Gandhi standard, the Mother Teresa standard so high that none of us could ever reach it and then all of us live defeated. Or we can have no standard or challenge at all. Like okay, one of the guys I hate this because we're talking about individuals now, but um Francis Chan is somebody that challenges me a lot 
in things. And and sometimes I feel like, oh, come on. Like Sometimes I listen to Francis Chan. I'm like, wow, that was amazing. I want to live more like that. And other times I'm like, man, I just, after listening to that, I feel just guilty. Like for being alive. Yeah. You know, for wanting to, you know, go and watch a football game or do something normal. And so I do think there is somewhere in there um, we can almost overguilt ourselves for just living normal lives. And I think you can radically follow Jesus and still have a family and all the things that go along with living as a part of your culture. Okay, so we're gonna get back into <laughs> we're gonna get back into the level of cool that you can have or pursue as a pursuit without being morally compromised. But let's let's pause and talk about what are, what it means to live a radicalized lifestyle. I think when we hear, hear the term radicals, sometimes it feels like terrorists. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, oh, the radical Christians were the ones who did the Spanish Inquisition and the Crusades, right? So let, let's maybe detach radical. But um, we could talk about devout, or we could say, I don't even know what another word is that's not so hot, you know, so that uh, has a connotation of being something else that's violent. But we're talking about... How about uh, authentic, passionate? Yeah. I'm an sure. authentic follower of Jesus, and I'm passionate about doing this th- and with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. So what, what does it look like to be on the far end living fully sold out as a Christian then? You know, because if you're, you're saying it has nothing to do with how you dress necessarily or how much money you make or the thing you live, you know, the house you live in or what you listen to, who you hang out with. What is it that could really be boiled down to like the ethos of living a sold out, passionate, authentic lifestyle? So I hate to oversimplify, but I mean, maybe part of the problem is that we are trying to come up with a definition for things that Jesus already defined for us for us. So he said, what do I have to do? And he says, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. And if you want to boil it down to one word, love, okay? Okay, wait. So I'm going to pause you there because I feel like we're, we're going to overshoot this. You, I yeah. feel like it could well, be oversimplified. I don't want to re- – that's why I said I don't want to reduce it. But the words we're throwing around, like, uh, you know, radical or, or superficial or whatever. Okay, Jesus never got into that conversation. So if we're going to follow – He did, though. How, give me an how about, example. How about, how about the, the rich man, you know, where he was talking about the eye of the needle and, you know, hey, I've followed the commandments all my life. And he says, go and sell everything you have to the poor. And he said he walked away sad, you know, and Jesus says, well, it's, it's easier for a rich man to enter um, or to, it's, you know, yeah. to enter the kingdom of heaven than it is for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle. So that kind of comments, I mean, Jesus talked a lot about things like money and appearances and, you know, but that, that particular story isn't about money. It's okay. actually about making anything an idol. That that So he was basically saying, look, you said you kept all the commandments, but commandment number one is don't have any other gods before me. And obviously you're worshiping money because you can't let go of it. So he was actually pointing out you haven't even gotten to commandment number one. So yes, to become a Christian, you have to die. You have to die. And then if you die, you will live. That's what water baptism is. You lay down your life. You bury yourself. Be specific about when you say you have to you die. You have to die to yourself, to your own desires, to your own ways, to your own pursuits, to your own ability to know God in your own works and efforts. So, yes, it is death to life. Maybe the American gospel has not so much overemphasized blessing, but underemphasized death. Because there is blessing as a part of following Jesus Christ, but not until you die. Okay. You die so you can live and then be blessed, not to be just kind of wealthy and yeah. live in the high life, but so that you can then be useful to the purpose of God, to love God and love people. So I think what we sometimes miss is that Christianity isn't a club you join. It isn't, it isn't something you get into. So we're going to talk to Brian Sixsmith. Ben Sixsmith. Ben, <laughs> what I would say is, look... Um, if you want a life with God, you've got to die to everything. Okay. And in Rattle that, you will list. receive Jesus. Rattle off a list to me of things you have to die to. Well, die is die. I know, I know. But, well, you but, can't die let, and keep things in your hand. Let, let, let's talk about that, though. Be specific here. Okay. What is, what is the American culture or your average American or even Westerner or whatever? What do they struggle to die to? And what Pride, maybe you personally? security, okay. finances, money, popularity, acceptance, status, status, accomplishments, 
um, pleasure, uh, you name it. Identity. Identity. It's all, all of that. So Jesus said, look, if, if anyone wants to come after me, they have to take up their cross, deny themselves, and follow me. Whoever seeks to save their life will lose it. But whoever was willing to lose their life for my sake will find it. So the moment of salvation is a moment where you say, okay, I surrender everything, every part of who I am, I surrender. I lay it all down. I die to myself. And I now receive the life of God in me. Now, the death process is not a one-time thing. It's a daily thing. So every day we wake up and we say, God, it's all yours now. Put it in your hands. I want to live for your purpose. And that then is the daily pursuit then of love God, love people. Now, Carl Lentz, I think, could do that with the leather jacket and the tattoos and the, and the nice hairstyles. I don't think any of that is that he wasn't dead to himself because if you want to reach people from a particular culture, like Hudson Taylor, when he went to China, dressed like they did in China so that he could reach the Chinese people. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so nothing wrong with putting on a tire that makes you acceptable unless you start to serve the image that you've created of yourself. So rather than serving Christ and his purpose, you've begun to serve something else. And then it starts to feel a little weird. And then people look at you and they start to say, that just doesn't feel like, like a Christ thing there. That feels like a, man, I can hardly see Jesus behind you. You're just shining so brightly right now that I can't see Jesus in, in this whole thing. But that's just as true with the religious pharisaical crowd. They just happen to wrap themselves in different clothing. They wrap themselves in the clothing of judgmentalism and legalism. I'm like, oh, we're yeah. calling people out. Yeah. So, so, so anything yeah. that doesn't say to people, look how, look how Jesus that person is. Hmm clouds people's view of who Jesus is because that's what we, we want to be authentically who we are and the personality that we are, reach the culture we're supposed to reach. And yet at the end of the day, we want people to say, wow, you know that pastor over there? Every time I'm around them, they make me feel like I want to, I want to go after Christ more with all my heart. There's something about them that's contagious to my faith. Like I want what, I want their, what they're going after. Yeah. And so I think... I think, um, you know, you kind of have to, 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 we can't get too wrapped up on the things we don't like about our culture and then just condemn all of that. Otherwise, we end up in the other box, right? Now we're Pharisees. Okay, so, so I, don't, I don't think this is a Pharisaical part of the conversation, though, to discuss is, like, at some point you slide, because even someone like John Cooper would say, well, you don't want to, you don't have to be Amish. You don't have to, you know, wear a priest's garment all the time to have a level of Christianity. I think he would probably say pastors should be models of what we want other Christians to act like. So if you look at how he dresses, I mean, he dresses cool. I'm not, I don't think he's against it in general. At some point there is a, a level when you slide past the usefulness of being relevant and having credibility into there's now a tension that you're seeking. Yeah. And, okay, and, so and it's, it's probably drawing attention away from Jesus, right? It's at a certain point, it's like, oh man, that person's awesome. That person is so cool and such a great speaker and looks awesome. And someday I want to be like that guy. But it's probably less because of your death to yourself and your pursuit of Jesus, and it's more because of the social clout that you've gained. Yeah. So, so I'll just describe my own personal journey here. I have never really cared that much about my image, but I'm married to a wife. Melody, who really takes care of me and makes sure that I stay at least somewhere in the relevant zone <laughs> in terms of what I wear, okay, yeah. or my hairstyle or whatever. Um, so sometimes I'll be with people your age or younger and I'll say, should I be wearing this? Does this look like somebody who's a 56 years, year old? And what, what I often hear back is, no, you look good. You look good. I think that totally fits you. Um, and then I'll, sometimes I'll hear, no, nah, I don't think you should wear that. If you go down that, that page, like for instance, I said, should I get on TikTok? And somebody said, no, nah, that's, really, <laughs> that's not really your zone. Nothing wrong with being on TikTok, but as a 50-something, you should probably not be on TikTok because then it'll feel like you're trying too hard. Yeah, sure. Like you're now trying to wrap your, your relevance. And then what, then what they've complimented me on is this idea to say, you are who you are. I like actually who you are. I, I actually don't want to be any different. I want, don't want you to be any different than you are. I want you to be exactly what you are. And, and I want you to be authentically you. And I can be influenced by you for who you are. I don't actually have to have you change. And I think that's the thing. Like, you got to be who you are. If, if you are cool and you like cool things, be who you are. So how do you offset it? Let's say you are really cool. 
yeah. or or you like that and you've been that's kind of been a part of your life and you, you're into fashion and to you know because there, there's probably a way to dress really cool without it being you know idolatrous or watering down the gospel if you are that kind of a person what what should that person be doing to protect themselves or the people that are in their congregation from missing the point you know what i mean well, okay and, so if you're starting to hear people that are questioning how you look or and they're not doing it from a pharisaical point of view but let's say you are a public figure an influencer and you're catching a lot of criticism from people for being overly over the top you know slick or smooth or whatever cool uh get people around you especially older men and women and let them speak into your life over it and if they see something about who you are submit it to them and say what about my lifestyle right now, my brand right now, my influence, do you think could be a distraction to my ministry? And I think that's actually a really good thing to do in every area of life, is if you're finding some place of dissonance in the way that you're leading, submit yourself to older people who will be able to speak, speak into your life in a way that's non-judgmental and yeah. not harsh, yeah. so that they can bring you back to a point of balance. That's really good. Okay, so I, I like what you said there, because I think that a lot of people would hate to have that discipline, but it's probably really important. It's not just asking people that are younger or that are caught up in the same culture that are your peers, the yes people, but it's finding what you said, the older generation. Well, for me, as an older guy, I ask you, I actually don't go to the older generation because if I ask people who are in their 70s, what do you think? <laughs> they probably wouldn't have a good opinion. Yeah, so yeah, I go yeah. to the 20-somethings and I sure. say, with my life and what I'm doing, is there anything about me? Because... I think you need good, again, don't listen to the haters. They have no value to offer you. But there are people that love you and believe in your ministry and are not trying to judge you. They want you to be the best version of yourself. Filter who you've become in your image through the lenses of people who really care about you, who, who you can consult with and gain wisdom from, and that will help balance you out. So you're talking about the importance of finding dissenting voices yeah. that are not just you know a ball of bitterness like because i think some people don't have any dissenting voices or or you know what ben sixsmith if i knew him and i could get him to come to allison park i would sit down with ben and say what is it about who we are as a church what is it about what i am as a pastor that you are challenged by and what is it that you're a little disappointed in if you could change anything, what, what, what do you think we're missing? Actually, sometimes those that don't know Jesus have a lot to offer us yeah. when it comes to what they see about who we are. I actually think that's a great filter, too, so that we're actually getting good input so that we can represent, represent Jesus well in the world. Yeah, that's really good. Okay, so let's, let's kind of jump back on to this cool idea then, right? So, so you're, you're essentially saying that you don't think that cool is inherently an idol or there's not a causal link, um, but it can be. So uh, if, if, there is, if there is, or I guess it, we've already said there is room for cool in the church, what kinds of things do you think are too far? I know that you're, we're sort of defining like a... Yeah, so I think methods, are, methods are, are always completely wide open. Methods aren't sacred. The message is. So I don't think I would... I love innovation, and I love creativity, and I don't want to cross any method off the table unless it would lead people to do something that's sinful or harmful to others. I'm not ex against any methodology that might be an attempt to reach people. So like Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, I become all things to all men so that by all means, all means, I might possibly reach somebody. So musically, in terms of dress, in terms of your approach, okay, it could be immodest. It could be, it could be something that you would say that's a little too far. You know, mm. uh, that could cause somebody to have some type of a, you know, temptation or thought. But but I think I'm I'm open to innovation. I think methods methods should be wide open because the culture is always changing around us. Yeah. But the core of who we are as followers of Jesus that doesn't change. The message of Jesus doesn't change. Yeah. This is really good. So I, I, I think if I could kind of crystallize what you're talking about, I'm, I'm processing this myself now. Because um, a lot of the questions that I have are sort of about where this line is. You know, one of the questions I have um, that I don't want you to answer just yet, but would be how do we know, how would a pastor know if they've struck a balance between relevancy without being a sellout? But I guess a lot of, a lot of this comes down to having the right voices in your life. Yeah, it does. Yeah, and, and, and taking the people who are in your life 
and listening to those voices in balance. So I pastor a multi-generational church. Um, typically, someone my age will tend to listen to the older voices more because my preferences as a 50-year-old line up with what people who are also 50 and 60 think. I have tend to listen more to the 20-somethings because I know I need their voices more in my life in order to reach them, right? Not that I ignore the older generation, but I already know what they think because I am one. So, so listen, if you're in your 20s, what you may need to do is don't just be in the echo chamber of other people in their 20s. You need someone who's older than you yeah. who can actually speak into your life to give you the balance that you need. And so I think generationally we need each other. I think, um, I think demographically we need each other. I think we need to understand that there are different cultures, even based on ethnicity and race, sure. sometimes that we need to listen to each other. And so interpreting what we do through the input of other people so humility is one of our big values. In order to be humble, you've got to be willing to listen to advice and input, even things that sound difficult. Yeah. I don't know whether Carl Lentz or Rabbi Zacharias had the kind of accountability that they needed of people speaking into their life, but I think that's one of the big protectors, and that's where we find the proper line. Right, so that, that's actually, that was what I was just thinking about, I guess, as you were, as you were speaking there, is maybe, like, it's not so much you know, cool or even a certain type of idol, but it's sometimes pride or yeah. arrogance or hubris. Yeah, with lack, a lack of, of humility. A, lack of, yeah, lack of humility where there's not, not enough accountability. Yeah. And I do think that there tends to be a link between people that are in power and more moral failures, you know, alongside of a lack of accountability. Well, I mean, hey, anybody popular or in power um, is can be seduced by both of those things or by somebody in their life that is seduced by those things. Yeah. And so uh, having the proper boundaries in place, making sure you don't put yourself in vulnerable positions with people that you might be tempted by, um, being accountable properly to your spouse, and, and just being uh, you know, authentically open to hear advice, I think is all part of the protection that we build around our, our life. Okay. So if, if someone finds themselves in a position where, especially because I, I think a lot of, a lot of leaders are struggling with a lot of different things that tend to be hidden, you know, in sure. private. And maybe it hasn't overtaken, it hasn't blown up into anything big, but there is that sneaky, shameful thing that is like, oh, you know, if if a pastor or a leader or an aspiring pastor or leader who maybe doesn't have the public audience but has an issue and maybe has the ability to eventually be raised up on a platform, has something they're struggling with, what would you say, like, what, what do you do to, I guess, A, die to yourself, as we're talking about, because that has to be a practice, but to really guard your future ministry and leadership and platform? Yeah, you need to be with people on a regular basis that you can be 100% transparent with who are not impressed at all with who you are. Where do you find that? Well, that's really hard to find, but typically it's not within your ministry because everybody's looking to you. It's, it's peers, it's dads and moms that you can go to, spiritual dads and moms can go to, that you can be completely transparent with them. They can look you back in the eye. They know, they, they saw your post on Instagram of how many people you had last weekend, and they really don't care because all they care about is you. And if, you have, if you're not transparent with anybody in your life and you're living, so here's, here's what happens. I'm living with secret sin that nobody else knows about, and I feel compromised. And then I put on social media these impressive pictures of how well I'm doing. Now we have the dichotomy in my secret life I got, I got some serious issues. In my profile, I am the most successful pastor ever. Now we're, now we're living a double life. This is duplicity. And so if you're going to be a person of integrity, your posts online and your, your secret life, your private life, has to be the same. you got to be the same person in both places. If you're not, if you're not authentically that, now you're not going to show your, your worst moments on Instagram, but there is a balance. Sometimes people only show highlight reels and they never share any vulnerability. So I think you got to be the same person all over the place, the same in private as you are in public. And, and you have to have people that know everything about you so that you're not hiding anything or hiding from anything. Give me the Jeff Leak suggestion for best practice. How often, how routine should you be interacting with people who are extra nosy who have permission to dig really far how often should that ha be happening once a month at least okay and if you're going through a particularly difficult time probably more often does that increase or decrease as you gain stature or i think it i think it decreases the longer you're in relationship with your accountability group 
So as you, as you do life together, you can actually afford to not talk to each other for two months. And if you have something that's going on, you can call somebody up and in a second, you're right back where you need to be. In the early stages when you're building that rapport, that's gonna take a little bit more time, a little bit more consistency. And so as time goes on, uh, the need for regularity is not as great, but then you still have to be willing to pull the accountability when you're in a crisis. Like I'm really tempted right now, I need to pull on you. And if you don't, if you're able to hide somewhere, that's where you're most vulnerable. And truth be told, what really is the problem for Carl or Rabbi or anyone else that falls isn't the degree of cool. It's the degree of hiddenness yeah. that, that might be present in their life when it comes to their own personal struggles. So I, I know, you know that there is a degree of uncomfortability, uncomfortability. I don't know how to say that <laughs> yeah. word. Discomfort, Discomfort is a better, is. better way yeah. to say that word. Um, that, that people who are listening to this might be feeling because if there are things that only a few people, people know about that's really a big struggle, it's like the worst feeling. Like, oh my gosh, you know. So if, if somebody is hearing this right now and there's this little bit of onset of panic, like I want that, but I don't know how to start this process without losing everything I've built and possibly hurting my family, and I don't even know where to go in the first place. Do you, do you have any recommendations of resources or steps somebody could take? Because um, I don't know that we've hit a level of practicality where if I'm listening to this, I know what I'd want to do. And I bet you, even if there are listeners who maybe aren't in a position of leadership, they are dealing with something that they need to take a really big step on and that they've been reluctantly avoiding it, partially out of ignorance. I don't even know what I would do. So what would you, what would you say? What's your challenge? Well, first thing I would say is that it's so freeing to get it out in the open. Oh, it's just torment to live with the secret. So, so to, to actually go and tell somebody and have that burden lift off you, oh, get, do it as soon as you can. Secondly, there's always a pathway forward. So um, for most things, for basic struggles, you can actually go to a pastor or a close friend and confide in them, and it's not going to risk your whole ministry. It's just going to begin a good conversation with them. For things that you know are potentially ministry-ending, they would disqualify you. Um, look, let's just face it, you probably need to go through some type of restoration, whether you like it or not. And so go to the most loving um, person in your life who holds some degree of spiritual authority for you and, and tell them what's going on and let them guide you through the process of, of getting restored. Because if you keep on hiding it and you know you, you, you shouldn't be where you are, eventually if you get caught, it's so much worse. I mean, it's just so, and so you're, you're, you're basically walking towards a moment of exposure anyway. There's going to come out. It's much better to have purpose to deal with what you need to deal with than to just let it continually fester. And, and here's the deal. A lot of things that the devil torments us about to say, you shouldn't be in ministry, look how horrible you are, are really not ministry ending. Um, most things that are happening in private can be redeemed in private. And so I, I would just say, there's a whole lot more of the redemption of, and grace of God out there than you realize, but not if you keep it a secret. The power of secret sin is in its privacy. And so as soon as you get it out in the open, and not out in the open for the whole world to see, but to the proper people, it's amazing how much restoration can happen. Uh, I'm involved with this with young men, especially in my life, all the time. Yeah. And it's so beautiful for me as a spiritual dad to look someone in the eye and say, it's all right, man, I forgive you. Let's, let's build some protections around your life. Let's, let's, let's decide how to rebuild whatever was broken. And God has a call on you, and he's got a future for you. And so don't let go of that. But you can't hide it and it not eventually not come back to bite you. Yeah, this got really, really deep and yeah, <laughs> crazy. But, but really, that's your question. It wasn't about cool. Yeah. It's really all about what it is to be authentic and be a person of integrity in a, in a culture that's caught up in superficiality. And that means we got to die to ourselves, and we got to be real, and we got to be transparent, and we got to be rigorous, and we got to be humble. And all of those things are a battle in our society, especially when the Instagram comparison yeah. is the standard for success. Yeah, whenever image becomes an idol, that's when secrecy really becomes a huge factor in a person's life. It's, it's an essential. <laughs> yeah, and it's like a cancer that yeah. eats you from the for, from the inside out. It's almost like the filters that people use to remove the blemishes from their face. 
in a photo is what we tend to do in ministry. Yeah. We want to remove all the pretend. We don't want anybody to see what's really going on because we're afraid what that might mean. But see, we're ministers of grace. Yeah. We're, we're here to tell the message, not to say, look how perfect I am. We're here to say, look at how much God has redeemed me from. Look at the grace of God that's been displayed in my life. If there's hope for me, there's hope for you too. And that's what that's what really Christianity is all about. Yeah. So let's let, let's let's close by offering some local helpful resources. I think for anybody who's hearing this that's in our Allison Park network, you know, maybe you're not a leader, maybe you're on staff or something like that. You you know, I just want to offer you could talk to me or Jeff. Yeah. And we would love to to work with you and help you however that might be. And if you're a pastor. Maybe who is not a part of the network, or even if you are, there's so there's a ministry in Ohio that we've worked with over the years and have sent people to get counseling there. It's confidential. It's called Emerge Ministries. It's a counseling center that especially focuses on pastors. I actually believe that the district we're in, with our local denomination, has an, uh, a branch of Emerge at their district office now, which allows for people. But honestly, you could talk to any counselor, um, and or. If you have a pastor friend from another place, they're serving in another area, uh, they, they often could be a good call too because they don't have necessarily oversight over you. Um, so I would, say, I would say start simple with the people that are nearest to you. But if you're really worried about confidentiality, then, then get in touch with one of these other organizations that specialize in helping pastors and leaders. Yeah, and, and again, I don't. this is not where I was... Planning to take the conversation, but I think it's good that we landed here. And I just I think it's important just to to challenge people. Like this is one of those areas of bravery that makes all the difference in terms of somebody's long term legacy and family health and yeah. spiritual health. Yeah, because my goal as a fifty six year old, I want to finish well. Yeah. At the end of my life, I want to be able to say I was faithful to my wife. I was faithful to my church. I was faithful to God. Like Paul said, I didn't steal anybody's money. I didn't live with a lack of integrity. I, I served Jesus with all my heart, with passion, until I died. And uh, I don't have any regrets. I can say that up until this moment. Right now, I'm committed to finishing my life 100% well. And if you can't say that, but you're in a process of restoration, then coming back into it is a part of your message and your story. So God's not after perfection. He just wants all of you. Yeah, that's that's a great way to close. So I hope you enjoyed this discussion. Um, and as always, I would just encourage you to subscribe and share, leave us reviews on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify, uh, and, and let other people know about this. You know, also on YouTube because we we want to be a resource and blessing to those who are able to, to access this. So thanks for joining us for our new episode. Hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you guys next week.